Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this month's Black Box Lecture. Thank you very much for coming along. Our talk today is about science and technology at the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. Uh, we have two speakers uh, to give us this presentation. First is Dr Ian Nesbitt. Ian is the uh, Deputy Director of Commercialisation at the AIBN, um, which of course is based at the University of Queensland. Ian has many years' experience in uh, development of drugs and um, business development associated with that, uh, and he's worked in the international um, biotechnology sector. He's currently chairman of several companies, working again in the biotechnology uh, area, and executive director of some further companies as well. Our second speaker is Dr Claudia Vickers. Uh, Claudia is a senior research fellow at the AIBN, where she works in the uh, Systems and Synth Synthetic Biology Group. Uh, Claudia has won several um, awards and fellowships and prizes, including the Queensland State Government Smart Futures Fellowship and the University of Queensland Foundation Research Excellence Award. Uh, could I ask you to welcome our speakers uh, to the podium today, starting with Ian. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Ken, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here today to be able to talk to you about the work that we're doing at AIBN. What we're going to do is a bit of a tag team. I'm going to give an overview uh, of the Institute, uh, some of the programs that uh, we're doing there at uh, a fairly high level, uh, and then Claudia is going to do a bit of a deep dive into one specific area, and it will become obvious as we go through um, why we're approaching the talk in, in this way. Uh, I want to start, though, by saying uh, I'm a Melbourne-based person. I live here in Melbourne. Uh, as uh, Ken said, I've spent uh, my entire career in the drug development industry. And uh, you might ask, might well ask, and sometimes I ask myself, what's a Melbourne person doing working at the University of Queensland, uh, particularly uh, when I'm flying back and forth uh, three uh, weeks every month to the University of Queensland, I often ask myself, uh, why am I doing this? Uh, and hopefully by the time we get to the end of the presentation, you'll have a pretty good idea why it is I actually do that, because AIBN is a very exciting place, uh, place to work. And for me, as a person who has spent uh, his entire career looking at ways of getting products out into the marketplace, one of the things I'm really proud of is the fact that at AIBN, even though it's an institute within the University of Queensland, it is very focused on outcomes and applications of the technology. And again, hopefully you'll get a feel for that uh, as we go through the presentation. So, firstly, some of the um, nuts and bolts of the institute. Uh, we're a fairly new institute, founded in 2003. Uh, founded uh, by Professor Peter Gray, the first director and the only director of the Institute uh, so far. We have a wonderful uh, purpose-built facility at the University of Queensland, uh, supported by the Queensland Government, um, Atlantic Phil Philanthropies as well. Uh, and we have a very substantial research program. So this is, this is a big effort uh, at ARBN. 19 group leaders, about 450 people uh, on that site there, and an annual budget of more than $40 million. Uh, a lot of it uh, grant funding, some of it from, uh, from industry. So it's a major uh, research exercise. As I've already mentioned, a big part of the Institute is the fact that it has a focus on translational research. So we are an institute within an academic uh, environment, so excellence in research is the primary motivation of all the people within the institute. Uh, and excellence in, in particular uh, related to biological and nanotechnologies, as the name uh, would infer. Uh, and we apply those technologies across a wide range of areas, uh, health, industrial, environmental issues. My background is as a biologist, so I can understand about a third to a half of the things that are going on there. And when I get to uh, talking about some of the technologies, uh, it, I think it'll be obvious those that I'm more familiar with and those ones that are sort of uh, way outside of my depth. So we cover a very, very wide range of areas. And certainly a number of those areas, I think uh, you'll find there's uh, common interest here with uh, DSTO. So we're doing this research. Uh, we're looking to uh, apply it to advances in knowledge, products and processes. So again, within an academic environment, uh, first and foremost, 
uh, traditionally is the application of technology to advances in knowledge. But we're very focused also at ARBN in products and processes arising from that knowledge. We work hard to establish collaborative links with research groups uh, and with industry. Uh, and we work very closely with industry to address real issues. So uh, again, we are an academic uh, group sitting in an academic environment, but we work very, very hard to make sure that what we're doing has real, uh, real life uh, outcomes. We've got a fantastic building and we've got a fantastic set of capabilities within that uh, building. We were very successful with the uh, NCRIS uh, program. We have a number of NCRIS facilities situated within the Institute. Uh, things like the National Biologics Facility, uh, the, uh, the Queensland Node of the Australian National Fabrication Facility, uh, the Queensland Node of Metabol Metabolomics Australia. We also have a protein expression facility uh, where we make proteins uh, for ourselves, for other uh, academic groups, but also for industry. Uh, and we've got a substantial uh, stem, uh, stem cell core facility. Uh, we have a very, very large uh, focus within the Institute on uh, stem cells. If you looked at our website, you will have seen uh, these pictures. Uh, we, rec we recently uh, redid our website, uh, streamlined it, and this slide really encapsulates what ARBN is about. So uh, you'll see up the top there four uh, areas where we focus our attention, uh, cell and tissue engineering, systems biology, nanomaterials, and nanobiotechnology. Uh, and then on the bottom, you'll see the areas where we're trying to apply those technologies. So health, energy, manufacturing, and sustainability. For today's presentation, uh, I'm just gonna take you through some of those uh, technologies and some of the applications. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about cell and tissue engineering uh, because I figured that would be probably a little bit outside the uh, areas of interest for DSTO. Uh, and Cordy is going to focus on the systems biology. So what I'm gonna do in the next uh, a uh, dozen slides or so, is focus on nanomaterials and nanobiotechnology and show some specific projects uh, as to how those technologies are being applied uh, to the different areas uh, described down the bottom. So firstly, linking nanomaterials uh, and health. This project is one of our flagship projects within ARBN. It's uh, needleless, as opposed to needless, uh, vaccine delivery um, or nanopatch. And you can see up there on the right hand side uh, a picture of a needle. Needle and syringe is technology from 1853. Uh, that was the original publication of a hypodermic needle and uh, um, syringe, uh, actually used for removing blood from, uh, from patients. Um, but it was, it's been used uh, ever since vaccines were developed for administration of vaccines. So very, very old technology. Uh, what we're doing with Nanopatch uh, is applying uh, modern materials technology uh, to uh, the science of vaccinology. So we're combining material science and immunology. And there really is a very, very nice um, overlap between these two areas. So what we're doing here is coding vaccines, traditional vaccines at this stage, um, onto tiny needles, 100 nanometer long uh, silica needles, uh, in a uh, nanopatch. So you can see here, this is a nanopatch. This is an EM of a needle um, on the nanopatch, one single needle, penetrating down through uh, the uh, uh, dermis into the, uh, or into the intradermal layer. Uh, and here's where the materials science meets immunology. Uh, it's been known for a long time that the dermis uh, is a very rich source of dendritic cells, which are uh, cells that process uh, foreign antigens. Uh, and so it's been known that if you could actually deliver a vaccine to uh, this sort of uh, uh, intradermal layer, uh, you can actually get good immune responses. So what we're doing with the nanopatch, te nanopatch technology is delivering vaccines to this specific um, layer of the skin uh, and targeting the vaccine to dendr dendritic cells. And by doing that, you actually have multiple advantages over traditional vaccine delivery. So firstly, you can get improved immunogenicity uh, at lower doses of vaccine. And you can see in the graph here, uh, this uh, I think is influenza vaccine. And you can see that line is a dose of vaccine delivered by nanopatch. Uh, 
and the red line here is delivered by a traditional needle and syringe. So you can see very readily you're getting orders of magnitude greater immunogenicity with lower doses of vaccine. Uh, so it's very important in terms of uh, rapid scale up of vaccine, uh, important in terms of, uh, of cost and so on. Uh, in addition, nanopatch product can be stored at room temperature. You don't need a cold chain, so there's improved stability. Uh, and finally, um, and uh, maybe not least importantly, uh, you don't have the pain associated with uh, the needle. So a lot of people uh, don't like getting uh, vaccine through a needle. This removes that, uh, that fear of the needle uh, from the administration. So should be able to increase vaccination rates. Uh, the nanopatch technology was a subject of a, uh, or is a subject of a spin-out company from ARBN called Vaxis. Uh, Vaxis is financed by three different venture capital groups and a few years ago raised $15 million in its Series A financing, which uh, we like to say is the highest Series A financing of any, uh, any company in Australia. I think that's, uh, that's probably accurate, not entirely sure. Um, and also recently Vaxis announced research partnership with Merck & Co. Uh, Merck's one of the great vaccine manufacturers of the world, so there's a way in which we're getting uh, validation by um, traditional vaccine manufacturers uh, that this technology will have a place to play in the future. So a very exciting technology and one that we're very proud of at ARBN. My next snippet uh, is the application of nanomaterials to manufacturing. In this case, we're looking at uh, nanocomposite materials, and in particular, a proprietary nanofiller uh, uh, additive to polyurethrane. Um, it's a form of nanoclay. Uh, you can see there the uh, pictures on the right. This is a schematic of the nanoclay structure, and this here is an actual EM, which looks a little bit like the schematic. Um, this technology was uh, taken by AN, uh, ARBN, or taken out of ARBN, and put into another spin-out company a few years ago called Tenacitech. Uh, so the, the benefit of this particular technology is that when you add this nanofilia, nanofilla to polyurethrane, uh, you actually improve the performance of the material, uh, but you don't have any loss of flexibility. Uh, we've done a lot of work with this, uh, this material across a, a lot of potential applications. Uh, I didn't put the, uh, the graph in here, but you can see things like uh, increased tear strength, uh, in, increase compressive resistance, increase creep resistance, uh, tensile, tensile strength, um, and increase barrier to gas transmission. Uh, of course, there are other, um, important applications, uh, and Darren Martin, who is the uh, group leader for this particular uh, technology, Darren is an avid golfer. There's a very nice golf course just down the uh, river from, or just upriver from UQ, where Darren plays uh, as much as he can. Uh, and one of the uh, potential applications uh, of this technology in terms of improved um, strength and um, uh, resistance to tear uh, is in golf balls. And so we have some nice Tenacitech uh, golf balls that we hand out at, uh, at different functions. We're currently exploring commercial applications of this technology, again, across a wide range of, uh, of areas. Things like improve, improve scratch resistance of, um, uh, of acrylic materials, uh, things like uh, increased wear and tear, um, or rather reduced wear and tear uh, of, um, uh, of hoses that are used in uh, heavy equipment and so on. Uh, the CEO of Tenacitech is actually located in, in the United States, uh, as in, in the process of raising capital there and also uh, putting in place a, right, a range of partnerships. Uh, so far, the company has been funded uh, through VC financing, angel investors, uh, and also some money from the Queensland Government. So again, a spin-out company uh, based on ARBN technology that we're particularly proud of. Our next example uh, is the application of nanomaterials to the area of sustainability. <clears throat> uh, and this is the use of functional nanomaterials uh, in the treatment of, uh, of water. Um, this is work from Professor Michael Hughes' group at AIBN. Uh, and what Michael is doing is looking at uh, low-cost, high-performance nanoabsorbents uh, for basically uh, absorbing or chemoabsorbing uh, toxic anions and cations out of drinking water. Uh, and what Michael has done is identified one of these uh, nanomaterials 
that could potentially be used to remove arsenic from, uh, from drinking water. Uh, I wasn't familiar until I started talking with uh, Michael about this technology, just what an important problem uh, arsenic in drinking water is. And I've got some stats there. Uh, more than 137 million people uh, in more than 70 countries are at risk uh, of being poisoned by arsenic in drinking water. Uh, and over recent years, there have been major incidents in countries like Taiwan, Thailand, Taiwan uh, and China, um, but also uh, in the United States as well, where uh, in areas of, uh, of mining there have been contamination of uh, groundwater with arsenic. Uh, and you can see in the, uh, in the graph there uh, that using uh, the additive that uh, Michael's identified, uh, 0.1 gram of that additive to 30 grams of commercial product, you're able to reduce uh, the concentration of arsenic uh, in the uh, uh, feed water down from 50 parts per million uh, down below, oh, sorry, that's grams per, uh, micrograms per litre, down below the WHO standard of 10 micrograms per litre. Uh, and Michael is in the process of working up prototypes for this, um, this material at the moment, and hopefully, ultimately, we'll be able to have some sort of uh, pretty simple consumer uh, device for uh, efficiently removing arsenic from uh, drinking water. Next example, uh, nanobiotechnology and its potential application, again, in human health. And this one is uh, from uh, Anton Middleberg's group at AIBN and it's bioengineered virus-like particles. Uh, what Anton's team is doing there is working with uh, a um, muron papillomavirus protein, VP1 protein, so it's the protein that makes up the capsid structure for the muron polyomavirus. Uh, they're able to express that uh, VP1 protein in E. coli at very, very high yields uh, and the uh, molecule has the ability to self-assemble into capsomere structures uh, and also into virus-like particles. Uh, and what they've done is uh, engineered onto these virus-like, uh, onto the VP1 protein, different antigenic epitopes from important, um, uh, important pathogens, things like influenza, strep, uh, strep A, uh, and so on. Uh, and even with these foreign epitopes present, these molecules are still able to self-assemble into uh, three-dimensional structures. And you can see this structure here. This is a representation of the uh, uh, capsom uh, capsomere of the VP1 uh, protein with uh, an epitope from, uh, from influenza. Uh, and you probably can't see it too well, uh, but this is an EM of those capsomere structures uh, coming out of the process. Uh, and the good thing, uh, the nice thing about this particular technology is that Anton is an engineer by training. Uh, he's moved into an area of biology, so uh, vaccine development, but he's approached it with an engineer's hat uh, in mind. And engineers think about things in terms of processes and flow diagrams and so on. Uh, and I've got one of his flow diagrams down here. So this process has been thought of as an industrial process right from the start. Um, so it is capable of rapid scale up and all of the um, processes involved here are ones that are commonly used in vaccine manufacture uh, today. Uh, and the really important thing about this technology is that it allows for scale up to go from a gene construct to an actual pilot product in a matter of weeks. Um, now for most vaccines, uh, the rapidity of scale up is not so much of an issue, but for vaccines uh, against diseases like flu, where in the face of a new pandemic, you want to be able to make a uh, vaccine as quickly as possible, and uh, you know, a lot of it as quickly as possible. Um, the ability to go from a new type of virus uh, to a pilot vaccine in the matter of weeks may well be um, critical to preventing uh, the outbreak of a pandemic. Currently, flu vaccine is made in eggs. Uh, new strains have to be identified. They have to be adapted to uh, growth in eggs. They have to be uh, uh, grown up. And so the turnaround time uh, for a new flu vaccine is of the order of three to six months. Uh, and because each strain has to be adapted individually, you sometimes end up with strains that are very, very poor yielders and so you can't make much vaccine. By applying this sort of technology to emerging disease threats, uh, you can uh, potentially go, like I say, from a, a gene, from a new um, pathogen uh, to a pilot vaccine 
uh, end people in a matter of weeks. So my final uh, example is uh, back to nanomaterials, and in this case, applying it to um, potentially energy and also manufacturing. Uh, and this is the use of block copolymers uh, for nanofabrication. The particular application that we're working on at AIBN uh, for this technology is in the, uh, the printing of computer chips. I'm sure you're all aware that the uh, power of computers is dependent upon the number of transistors that you can print uh, on a chip. Uh, chips are printed um, a little bit analogous to a printing press um, by a process called photolithography. Uh, the uh, light shine down through a lens focused on the wafer uh, and uh, that actually prints the, uh, the circuit on the computer chip. Uh, and basically the circuit size is limited currently by the wavelength of light. Uh, you can go down to extreme UV, which is 13 nanometers, but that's basically the limit that you can get to in terms of printing using photo. What um, Andrew Whitaker and Idris Blakely, Blakely and their team at AIBN are doing uh, is using the self-assembly of copolymers in combination with photolithography to um, go down at, uh, to lower sizes than what you, or lower um, dimensions than what you're limited to by the wavelength of UV light. And you can see here, uh, this is, uh, these lines are drawn at about 100 nanometer uh, width using traditional photolithography. Uh, these are self-assembling polymers. You put the two together and you can get um, structures down approaching uh, the uh, 10 nanometer uh, and lower range. Uh, this project is a collaboration with the Dow Chemical Company uh, who have a very strong interest in this area. So hopefully through those sorts of examples, you'll see that we are applying technologies, biotechnologies and nanotechnologies and nanobiotechnologies uh, across a wide range of areas uh, with a number of very, very specific important outcomes in mind in terms of improvements to human health, improvements to uh, um, energy sustainability and so on. I must mention, I forgot, forgot to say, the photolithography project that I just mentioned, there are potential applications for that, not, not only in terms of printing uh, uh, microcircuits, but also in terms of energy storage, um, potential use in batteries and, uh, and, and so on. So you can see that we're covering a wide range of very important areas at, uh, at AIBN. I mentioned at the start that we're very big on engagement, particularly engagement with industry. Uh, we have uh, a number of spin-out or spin-in companies at AIBN, so uh, I've got eight there, it's eight, eight or nine at the moment. Companies that have either been spun out of AIBN based on AIBN technology, or companies that we've brought in from outside and given them a home within AIBN because they fit nicely with the technologies that we have within the Institute. Uh, and those companies have raised uh, between equity funding and uh, grant funding of the order of $20 million, and we're working at uh, making that uh, uh, even larger amount of cash going into those companies. We have about 50 patent families under, uh, under management, which is about a quarter of the total uh, patent output of the University of Queensland. We have major re relationships with uh, large companies like uh, Dow Chemical Company and DSM, which is a biologics uh, manufacturer, just uh, created a brand new um, manufacturing facility in Brisbane. Uh, and we've got multiple projects uh, encompassing things like ARC linkage grants, uh, funded research, collaborative research projects and so on with companies in Queensland, interstate companies and international companies. Uh, and we're happy to work with whoever uh, um, wants to access that technology, uh, no matter where they're located. We also have uh, a, an active program uh, of engagement on a project independent basis called the Industrial Affiliates Program. Uh, this is a membership based program where companies can actually join uh, as affiliate members uh, by virtue of uh, joining up to that program, uh, member companies are able to access AIBN f facilities and equipment and consulting advice at discounted rates. Uh, they get invited to networking events. Uh, they can um, nominate employees to be adjunct appointments, uh, have adjunct appointments at AIBN. Uh, and we also uh, work with them to put in place customised engagement uh, programs such as internships and so on. Um, I've got a couple of minutes, so I've got to tell... I, I've got to tell a story about the affiliates program, which I can really only tell to a Melbourne-based audience. One of the networking events that we do 
is um, a series of dinners called the Thought Leaders Dinner Series. Uh, so we've run five of these now. We're about to do our sixth uh, in, uh, in May. Uh, the idea of these dinners is we get uh, senior people from the University of Queensland, uh, ARBN, uh, people from government, people from industry, uh, at sort of CEO type level. Uh, and we invite uh, a uh, sort of eminent speaker to come along uh, for dinner, we target about 40 to 50 people, so these are pretty, pretty intimate dim dinners. Uh, and we ask our speaker to talk about uh, you know, their experience in the sector or their ideas. Quite often we get people from a finance background to talk about you know, financing and, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, these are really good dinners because we ask the speakers to be pretty candid in their comments. We get a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion going. Very, very popular events. We've run, uh, of the five that we've run so far, um, Four have been in Brisbane, one in Melbourne. The uh, sixth one is also going to be in Brisbane. So they're very Brisbane-centric, which is you know, natural because we're a Brisbane-based uh, institute. But we did run one in Melbourne. Uh, it was our first uh, outreach attempt to, to try and expand the visibility of AIBN uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and uh, when I was trying to get this, uh, so these are my responsibilities. So I've got to find the speakers and uh, do the organisation. I get, obviously get support at AIBN, but uh, these are my baby. Um, for the Melbourne uh, Thought Leaders Dinner, dinner uh, speech, uh, I got Mike Fitzpatrick, um, chairman of AFL, my hero because I'm Barrett for Carlton, uh, to uh, come along and talk to the uh, to the group. I was so chuffed when I got Mike to agree. I sat on a board with him and I had to twist his arm a little bit, but Mike agreed to to uh, give our uh, our thought leaders, thought leader dinner speech in Melbourne. Uh, I went along to AIBN and when Mike uh, agreed to speak, went to our group at his meeting and said, "I got fantastic news." Mike Fitzpatrick is going to be our speaker in, in Melbourne. And no name recognition whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, and then when we got to, uh, to have the dinner, uh, Peter Gray actually int introduced him as the ex-captain uh, of Collingwood. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's no value in getting a really high, um, uh, highly recognised AFL speaker um, for uh, a, a Queensland-based institute. But it was a great night anyway. Um, so that's our IAP program. Again, very, very focused on forming relationships with companies, uh, trying to get a level of interaction between our researchers uh, and people in companies because we believe that by having that engagement, they will lead to projects down the track. So they might not be an immediate benefit. We actually invest heavily in this program uh, and uh, our idea is that down the track it will lead to collaborative projects between AOBN and industry. Uh, we also collaborate very broadly internationally. Uh, this is uh, just an indication of where we collaborate around the world. You don't need to worry about too much the numbers, and they're probably a couple of years out of, out of date, but we do have uh, a very, very uh, outward-looking uh, focus at the Institute. And the last thing I want to mention before I hand over to Claudia uh, is we not only work very, very hard at uh, the work that we do internally and the work that we try and do in terms of building relationships with, uh, with industry. We also try to take a leadership role in our own uh, area. Uh, and so a couple of years ago, uh, we moved from having, once a year we would have a, an internal symposium. We actually decided we would make that an external conference. Uh, and so we started the um, International Conference on Bio Nano Innovation. The first meeting was in Brisbane in 2012. Uh, we decided to go international last year, and so the uh, second of that uh, series was held in uh, Beijing last year. Uh, this year, uh, the name has changed, or just for this year, it's called NanoBio Australia 2014, because it incorporates the fifth International NanoBio Conference and our third International Conference on Bio Nano Innovation, which is the ARBN Conference. That's being held in Brisbane uh, in July, you know, 6th to 10th of July. Uh, we are looking to uh, put together a fantastic program. You can see there some of the, uh, we can see the two, two organisers, uh, Matt Trow from AIBN and Keith McLean from CSIRO, who I'm sure you're very, very familiar with. Uh, we've put together a fantastic uh, group of speakers. The uh, plenary speakers uh, are listed there. And I just got to mention, we're able to get Leroy Hood, uh, who for people in the, um, 
the biotech uh, area um, will know Leroy Hood. Uh, he's founded uh, about 16 companies personally, including companies like Amgen and Applied Biosystems. He was the father of automatic, uh, automated DNA sequencing and protein sequencing. So fantastic coup for us to get uh, him as a speaker. Uh, and Pam Silver, um, according to Matt Trowell, she's going to be a future Nobel Prize winner, so we're really pleased to have her along, and the other speakers as, as well. It's going to be a great conference, and certainly if there's anyone from uh, DSTO who'd like to come along, we'd certainly be very, very pleased to see you uh, uh, at the conference. And we're certainly looking to uh, uh, add to the program uh, speakers from uh, you know, groups that we want to engage with, uh, people doing good work. So if anyone's interested in coming, and uh, particularly if you're interested in speaking, uh, we'd be very, very pleased to uh, to have you along to that conference. Uh, now that's all from me, so hopefully what I've given you uh, very quickly is an overview of the sorts of things that we do at AIBN, a level of excitement for the application to, of the biotechnologies and nanotechnologies across a whole range of potential um, applications. Uh, what Claudia is going to do now is focus specifically on systems biology and some of the specific applications there that might be of particular interest to DSTO. So, over to Claudia. Okay, thanks very much, Ian. So, as Ian said, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about our bioproducts research program that comes out of our systems and synthetic biology group, um, which is led by Professor Lars Nielsen um, at the Institute. And the title of the talk is From a Petrochemical Economy to a, a Biochemical Economy, Sustainable Environmentally Friendly Fuels and Chemicals from Engineered Microbial Biofactories. So we're basically looking to re-engineer living cells for production of byproducts at industrially relevant scales. A bit of the, I'd like to start the story with a bit of a rationalisation for why we're doing this research. And the, the one that really hits home for me is, is buying petrol at the petrol pump. When I start, first started buying petrol, um, it was about sort of 60 cents a litre. Um, and about a little over a decade ago, beginning of the, the, the 2000s, things changed fairly uh, dramatically and rapidly and the prices started to increase. You have noticed that here as well. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, right now, um, I haven't got the data between the end of 2011 and 2014, but right now we're sitting at about 160 cents per litre, which is a lot more than 60 cents per litre. And in Australia, one of the key reasons for that is because we are using a lot more oil than we are producing. So again, about um, in the uh, early 2000s, we, we started using more oil than we were producing, and the, the, the deficit is, is quite rapidly increasing. That will only go on to the future. So the trouble with fossil resources, including oil, natural gas, and various other uh, resources, is that we're running out of fossil resources that are easily and cheaply extractable. This, um, this peak oil graph is, is fairly um, controversial. It probably isn't really that accurate any longer, but um, what it serves to demonstrate is, is the availability of easily extractable fossil resources. So we've, got, we've still got lots, we've got, still got plenty to keep us going, but it's becoming more and more expensive to get a hold of them, more and more dangerous, and there are a lot, lot of other problems associated with them. So they're non-renewable, they're expensive. Um, our friends across the pond in Korea are spending 20% of their GDP importing fossil resources that they don't have access in their own country. It's an enormous amount. Um, there's other problems um, associated with, with other types of fossil resources apart from um, petroleum. So we have lots of other things in Australia that we can use, um, but there are problems like environmental damage, um, water use, water contamination, land use issues and carbon release issues. And people in general are quite concerned about this carbon release issue and lack of sustainability. So a lot of alternative energy replacements that are available now or coming online very soon, um, wind, waves, solar, uh, nuclear. But the problem is that we don't just get fuels and energy from petrochemicals. We get a whole lot of other things that are essential for our modern lifestyles. So the clothes that you're wearing now, the ground that you're walking on, the, the, the seats that you're looking in, they're all made out of petrochemical derivatives. We need to be able to access those to continue our lifestyle and to keep our standard of living into the future and to develop and, uh, um, and apply technologies into the future. And in particular, one of our research areas is, uh, is biofuels and, and um, aviation is a, has a particular problem because you need high energy density liquid fuels to fly around jets in. I think people had a crack at doing them um, electrically, um, but uh, it, it's quite difficult to do effectively. So that's where this group of, of natural products 
called isoprenoids come in, so the byproduct group. Um, they're in a group of, um, of chemicals that are made by all living organisms and are essential for life. Uh, they function as uh, cell membrane components um, in electron transport, as plant hormones, as animal hormones. They're responsible for a lot of the pretty colours that we see in nature, and they're responsible for a lot of the nice flavours and smells that we see in nature. So things like the aroma of, of citrus fruits, such as lemon and orange, uh, the aroma of pine trees in the forest that make us sort of happy and want to be in the, the, uh, the forest walking. Um, they also behave as antibacterials in, in plant defence um, and animal defence as signals both within and outside the organism. Um, and they have a lot of very important roles in ecology and ecophysiology. So they're an extremely large group. There's over 70,000 of these guys known. They're extremely diverse chemically and structurally. And that diversity uh, allows them to have a whole lot of different applications also in industry to be used for things that think to be used for purposes that we're currently using petrochemicals for. Now, a lot of the petrochemicals that we're using now actually used to be isoprenoids in their previous life many, many millions and billions of years ago. So prior to becoming high energy density um, um, fossil fuels, they were actually slightly lower energy density plant produced by mass. And they come from this isoprenoid group primarily um, from our, well, primarily but, um, from the isoprenoid group and a, and a couple of other groups. So from isoprenoids at the moment, we're making a lot of different industrial products in the pharmaceutical area. So one particular one is a product called artemisinin, which is an anti-malarial that's being produced during um, with an with industrial fermentation processes now. Um, and the, the, the product was developed over sort of a 10 year time frame and it's now being used as part of uh, artemisinin uh, combination treatments in Africa and other countries where malaria is an enormous problem. Uh, we have food additives and supplements, so, so food color, colorings, um, vitamins, um, uh, antioxidants, um, and also a lot of different agricultural, potential for a lot of different agricultural applications, plant hormones, um, uh, fertilizer adjuvants, um, plant ar architecture, architecture and structural changes that we can control using plant hormones. Um, industrial chemicals is perhaps the area where I'm most interested in. So things like isoprene, it's a five carbon um, hydrocarbon, can be polymerized to make synthetic rubbers. And isoprene is quite interesting. It's made in enormous amounts by plants. In fact, it has a climate forcing effect. So it, it's made in the teragram amounts and it gets up into the atmosphere and reacts with other gases that might normally remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And plants produce more of it as they, um, as they heat up, as temperatures increase, so there's a potential for a snowball effect there. Unfortunately, we can't harvest this enormous amount of very useful carbon um, from plants, so we have to engineer it in microbes in order to be able to produce it as a product and turn it into synthetic rubbers, and that's one of the projects that we're looking at at the moment. A lot of the products we're looking at as well have fuel properties. So squalene is a bio-crude, um, isopentanol is a gasoline replacement, um, a group of chemicals called farnesine and limonene, C10, C15, C10, C15 um, combination makes a really nice jet fuel. Um, and I'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later. And basarbaline is a C15 diesel replacement. And of course, there's a number that, that um, have chemical properties that allow them to be used as fuel additives as well. And that, that sort of bottom area on the slide there is the area that we're particularly interested in at the moment. Problem is, as I mentioned with the isoprene, um, normally in biological sources, isoprene being an exception, they're not abundant enough. The production levels are highly variable, so it's a, a problem for an industrial, from an industrial point of view. Very hard to extract or purify from their sources. It's the case with isoprene. And they might be hard or impossible to synthesize chemically using petrochemical precursors, um, or they might just be too expensive to synthesize. So what we're doing is looking at redesigning microbial cells to behave as um, programmable manufacturing factories. And we want to be able to rationally re-engineer organisms for efficient production of these things at commercially significant yields using cheap renewable feedstocks from the agricultural sector, something where Australia is very, very strong in, in providing um, um, uh, feedstock for these kinds of processes. So what do I mean by since cells as programmable networks? Well, this is a, a, a basically an engineering diagram, which you should be reasonably familiar with, but it actually represents what happens inside a cell, or the chemical conversions that happen as carbon, if we use, use it as a, as, a, as a unit, moves through the cell and is converted from one biochemical into another biochemical. So you feed a carbon source into that network and it's converted into biomass and a whole lot of different biochemicals. Now, 
In order to produce a biochemical that we find interesting, if it's not already produced by the cell, we need to insert a couple of genes that encode enzymes that make that product. In this case, 1,3-propendiol, which is used as a uh, antifreeze and polymerizer to make making a number of different um, uh, bioproducts. So we insert a couple of genes, and then in order to get enough of that to make it usefully industrially, then we start removing genes. So we knock out different competing branches of that metabolic network. We overexpress genes in other places of the metabolic network to force carbon from the carbon source all the way through the product of interest. And ultimately, we end up with something that's actually produced at industrially relevant levels. So this is a DuPont, Tate & Lyle um, biopedio process, and they have a refinery in Luden, Tennessee. So as I said, the, the PDO is used to make a number of different things, um, fibres, carpets, um, plastics and things like that. Um, if you compare that, you can also get the, the, the product from petroleum and if you compare the bioprocess to the petroleum process, it's actually cost competitive, which is what it needs to be before you move from a, bio, from a petrochemical process into a biochemical process. And the reason it is is because it loses, uses 42% less energy and it's kind of nice that there's also a 56% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions on top of that. It's obviously successful. The product demand was so high they went through an expansion in 2011 by 35 per cent and they're making 60,000 tonnes per annum of this stuff now and using it for a variety of different things. So things aren't that simple, obviously. We don't just have a little process map with a couple of reactions here and there that we can kind of tweak a little bit and get the right product out of. It's a little more complicated than that. This is um, about 50 per cent of what we know about that goes on inside the cell. Um, and we need to be able to understand that as much as we can and able to, to enable us to engineer. So we're really reverse engineering systems that have evolved over millions and billions of years. So one of the cornerstones of our technological approach is um, in, in systems biology is to use computational metabolic modelling tools to reconstruct uh, a living cell's metabolism inside a computer to help us design in our design process to re-engineer the, the, the cells. So that's, that's a, a key part of our approach in the, in the top left here in the, the modelling part. Um, we then get into the lab, into the wet lab, and we manipulate using a synthetic biology approach. So cutting and pasting genes, um, redesigning how the carbon uh, moves through that metabolic network. We measure that using systems biology. So we look at how genes and expression is controlled on a whole lot of different levels. So we look at the DNA, we look at the RNA, we measure and, and, um, and uh, quantify uh, proteins and the metabolites, which are, of course, the interesting biochemicals that we're interested in, as well as all the intermediates and associated things that are going on in the system. And we actually can measure carbon flux as it moves through those carbon pools from one thing to another and look at the different routes that it takes to get to the end product. And of course, we then might go into the literature and we mine to identify genetic potential from other organisms that we can import into the organism that we're trying to engineer and be it yeast or bacteria or whatever other strange organism we're working in. Um, how does this process work overall in terms of a process? Fairly straightforward. You take your agricultural crop product, and in most cases, and it might be um, corn, so the bioethanol process in, in the US is, is corn based. So you hydrolyze complex carbohydrates like starch to give you glucose, feed that into your bioreactor with your engineered cells, and then you get your industrial chemicals out of that bioreactor. In our case, we're quite particularly interested in, in sucrose um, from sugarcane as a, as a feedstock. We have sugar industry in Australia and it's an excellent um, feedstock for these kinds of processes. So we've done quite a lot of engineering to understand um, about understand sucrose utilisation and develop that as an industrial bioprocess feedstock. So it's a preferred carbon source for these kinds of feedstocks. Um, the thing about a bioprocess, as I mentioned already, is that it's, it's an economic equation, it's a cost-benefit analysis. So as petrochemicals become more and more expensive and as the technology that we're developing decreases in, in, in price, eventually you hit a cost benefit where it becomes more favourable to use a bioprocess. And that's, as I said, when we switch to the bioprocess. Um, for bulk biochemicals in particular, like biofuels, biopolymers, the carbon source is the economic driver for that cost of that bioprocess. So you need to have a cheap uh, feedstock source, feedstock carbon source for the process. Um, the Australian sugar industry is really well positioned to provide that feedstock. Uh, we produce about 5 million tonnes per annum of, of raw sugar. 80% of that is exported. Um, the sugar industry faces um, enormous market competition from larger sugar producing companies such as Brazil and Malaysia. 
Um, there are a lot of side stream products apart from uh, uh, raw sugar that we can be using to, to feed our bioprocessors. And using those bioprocessors, we can develop value-added products that are worth five or ten times the price of raw sugar. Raw sugar is a commodity. It's traded on a commodities market. And we can significantly increase the value of that product by putting it through a fermentation process. And we can avoid that market competition by conversion into value-added products as well. That allows us to access new markets, both domestically and internationally. The sucrose bioprocessors are cheaper, which is mainly linked to the fact that there's a lot of um, what we call bagasse bi or biomass left over once you extract the sucrose. You can burn that to produce electricity to drive the process, and that decreases the price of the process significantly. Um, and also there are reduced greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at ethanol production on a um, corn-based ethanol production, versus sugarcane ethanol production, you see a 35% reduction in greenhouse gases from corn-based production and an 85% reduction from uh, sucrose-based production. So it's quite attractive uh, for those reasons for us. And we use this to build into a research program called the Korea-Australia Bioproduct Alliance, which is supported through the Queensland Government National International Research Alliance program and was a collaboration between us at AIBN and the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And the idea is to build a sucrose-based biorefinery um, for production, in this case, of butanol. So butanol is used in paint, paints and coatings and plastics. It's an 800 billion global industry, but it can also be used as a biofuel that has similar properties to gas, gasoline um, and a higher energy density than other replacements like ethanol. Commercial partners for this project were just Caltex and CSR. Um, we're working in an um, organism called E. coli, which you've all probably heard of before. Um, makes people sick a lot of the time, but there are a lot of strains of E. coli that don't make people sick. They're used in the lab as workhorses for producing a variety of different things. So we did a lot of sort of basic science and research around understanding how E. coli can use sucrose efficiently and improving the efficiency of that sucrose utilisation in order to apply it to a bioprocess. Um, and then we decided that we actually turn the sucrose into something useful. In this case, we're targeting a biodegradable plastic. So plastic is obviously an enormous problem from an environmental point of view. Countries are starting to ban it. Shopping centres are starting to stop using um, uh, plastic bags. Um, and we thought we'd use a, a biodegradable polymer called polyhydroxybutyrate, um, which can be used as a, as a uh, classical uh, plastic replacement. And using our engineering approaches, we were able to show that um, sucrose-based production is as good as glucose-based production, and then we could engineer much improved production on a sucrose-based bioprocess by knocking genes out, adding genes in, redirecting carbon flow through the metabolic network. And to cut a long story short, the way that we did that was force the carbon to take an alternative route. So this is sucrose entering the metabolic network here, and it can go via a number of different routes through central carbon metabolism here down to the final product, polyhydroxybutyrate. And we found that by forcing it through this EMP pathway route, um, we could get much higher PHB accumulation. The reason for those are varied and complex, and I won't go into them, but it has partly to do with re-scavenging from this pool of carbon, which is a side product from this metabolic pathway. Um, now, we, at the same time, our colleagues in Korea were looking at butanol production using a clostridium organism, which has been used for a long time to produce butanol, and they were also looking at trying to engineer butanol production in E. coli, which ultimately was found to be unsuccessful. Um, but they were uh, successful in improving their clostridium process, and they're now getting cost-competitive yields with the, with the petrochemical process. Um, they're growing at, doing it on glucose at the moment, but they're looking now, of course, to shift to sucrose as a preferred carbon feedstock, and GS Caltex are moving towards scale-up for that process. Now, back to the, um, the, the aviation fuel issue that we're trying to address sort of more directly now. So we use the Sucrose Bioproducts program as a sort of a platform to springboard into some other more interesting uh, bioproducts that we wanted to produce in this isoprenoid group that I was telling you about earlier. So that is, is been underway for uh, three or four years now, which is again supported through the Queensland Government and through the Queensland Sustainable Aviation Fuel Initiative. So the aim is to produce renewable jet fuel alternatives. Uh, we've got very strong support in the aviation, aviation industry, so 50% of the weight of a 747 on takeoff is aviation fuel. Um, and, it, and accounts for 50 to 6 per cent of, any, of the operating cost of any aviation company. The aviation industry as a whole is aiming for carbon neutral growth by 2020. <clears throat> and we work with Boeing and Virgin and Sky Energy to support that project. 
Uh, we've got, so we've got very strong industry, very strong research partners. Um, we work with a green biochemical company called Amaris out of California and the Joint Bioenergy Institute also out of California. And we are supported also by Mackay Sugar and IOI Energy. The two components, the first is a very important feasibility study looking at techno-economic analysis and life cycle analysis. You have to do that to find out if the process has ever got the, got the potential to ever turn around and, and make a useful product for you on a cost competitive basis. I don't have time to go into that at the moment. It's suffice to say that, that, that um, analysis turned out very favourable for sucrose based bioproducts. And the second part of it, which I'm going to go into a little bit of detail of, uh, on, is actually experimental production of that. And that's the part of the project which I'm um, in charge of. So how do you make uh, aviation fuel out of non-petrochemicals? Uh, well, fortunately, as I said, there's this group of chemicals called isoprenoids, and a lot of them have fuel-like properties. Uh, so there are a number of uh, 10 carbon and 15 carbon isoprenoids. One of them is called limonene. It's responsible for the citrus aromas of, in um, oranges and lemons and limes. Another is called myrcene. It's responsible for the smell of thyme. And phanacene is a, as a 15 carbon, which is responsible for the smell of green apples. So you have kind of nice jet fuel, nice-smelling jet fuel that comes out of this process. Um, it's made through a, um, a metabolic pathway that already exists in yeast, or the precursors to those are, are made through this metabolic pathway. And the way that you engineer it is simply introduce a few genes that help redirect carbon through this pathway and um, divert carbon into these different products. Now, this is a really interesting process because the feasibility has already been demonstrated by the company Amaris that we work with. So they have made a product, um, they, they're making already the, the 15 carbon farnesine in yeast cells and they were able to extract limonene from the, um, which is a, a, the 10 carbon um, from a citrus peel and mix it with some petrochemical myrcene and demonstrate um, by mixing that 50-50 with uh, standard aviation fuel that you can fly jets on this. So it's demonstrated feasible technology, but it's not feasible to extract the, the 10 carbon from citrus fruits and fly jets on it. So they came to us to ask about um, whether we could apply our systems and synthetic, synthetic biology approaches to trying to produce this 10 carbon in yeast and ultimately uh, produce both the, the 10 carbons and the 15 carbons in yeast to make a drop in jet fuel. Um, and of course we want to do that from sucrose as a, as a, um, as a preferred carbon source for the process. So we started engineering and at first we found it was very difficult, which is why they came to us to do it. Um, but we were, after a lot of um, uh, different kind of engineering approaches, able to increase our production by 65 fold, which is really great. Um, awesome start for this uh, particular research project. This is not industrial production levels yet, it's not commercially viable process yet, but um, we've got a lot more. This is just basically scratching the, the surface of this process. Um, we've got a lot more that we can do to improve that productivity. Um, I notice we're running short of time. Shall I wind up or me eat into the question time? Perhaps I'll, perhaps I'll sort of skip through this a little bit. I've got five minutes, okay. All right, so one of the problems with these guys, these um, C10 carbons is that they're highly toxic. And as soon as you add it to a microbial culture, the culture stops growing. So they don't just smell nice when they're recleaning products, your floor cleaner, they're actually toxic. They're actually there to, to kill bacteria on your toilet seat. Um, and we found that, um, if we use an, what we call an adaptive evolution process, so we add a little bit of a, a sub-lethal sub level of limonene to the culture, and we grow the culture, keep on adding in limonene, we can get the cells to evolve quite rapidly to be resistant to that toxic product. And then we can go and resequence the genome of that organism, and we can identify the genes that are responsible for that resistance. And then we can go and engineer those genes back into the organism, the wild-type organism, and re um, re-provide that resistance profile. And if we do that engineering, we can actually get resistance to the, the complex mixture, which is um, the, the mixture that we want to use for jet fuel. We can also use a bioprocess approach um, by adding a, a non-toxic organic extractant into the bioprocess. So that, or the, the cells that are producing are here in the bioreactor, they're producing into an aqueous phase, and the products immediately are partitioned into the organic phase and they become non-toxic as soon as in, they're in that organic phase. Uh, we can then do a product separa um, separation, phase separation, and product recovery directly from that organic phase. 
So we're interested in, as I said, in a whole lot of different isoprenoids. This is the same table you saw before with the ones that we're particularly interested or in producing in the lab highlighted here. One of them is this um, red pigment here you can see uh, called lycopene, which is, which is the, responsible for the red colour of um, tomato skins. These are different uh, engineered E. coli cultures that are producing different levels of lycopene, and that's used as a food colourant, as an antioxidant, as a nutraceutical. Another one we're interested in is the isoprene that I mentioned, er, mentioned earlier. There's a current global shortage of petrochemical-derived isoprene. The global market at the moment is um, uh, 1.7 billion pounds per, per annum. That's a quite pro approximately equivalent to one or two US billion dollars. Current growth is about 1%, but potential market with product replacements looking probably to be um, more like 11 billion pounds per annum. So that's a significant um, route for market there. Now, I just wanted to finish off by sort of getting people geared up about the, the excitement and the, the, the area, I guess, that we're working in here. Um, Ian mentioned earlier Moore's Law, the, the number of transistors on integrated circuits doubles approximately every two years. And this is what's represented here in this blue line here. And this is an exponential scale here. The tools that we use for this, our kind of technology, bioengineering, are DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis. Now we've gone through uh, uh, IT revolution, industrial revolution, agricultural revolutions, green revolutions. Right now, in the, we're in the age of the biological revolution, the age where we're learning to use biology and re-engineer biology to get it to help us live more sustainably and more sort of in harmony with our planet. And the rate that these technologies are improving is significantly greater than Moore's law. So things are going a lot faster. Right now, we can read DNA faster than the polymerase, the enzyme that makes DNA, can write it, which is quite a remarkable achievement. We're going faster than evolution, basically. So it's a very fast-moving science. In the short term, we'll be looking at new, new products, new markets. In the long term, we'll be looking at future-proofing our economy in this country. Now, as I said before, Korea is spending 20% of their GDP importing petrochemicals. They're right now spending 2% of their GDP developing um, IP and green replacements in this area, so they won't be spending 20% of their GDP in the future on uh, importing petrochemicals. So what, what, where is this technology going? Well, ideally, we'd like to have a chassis system where we can just take a, to a particular type of cell and sort of bolt on genetic modules that allow us to produce particular products with particular characteristics for very specific applications into the future. Um, and that's, that's the direction that we should be going in the, in the near future with this kind of technology. I'd just like to finish off now by thanking um, particularly Lars Nielsen, who heads the Systems and Synthetic Biology Group at AIBN, and especially our industrial partners, Boeing, Sky Energy, JBay, Amaris, etc., and the other people who are involved in this, uh, the research that I've been presenting to you today. And I'll leave you with that thought and apologise for going a little over time. Thanks for your time. <clears throat> Look, that was um, absolutely fascinating. Um, for, for so long, um, we've talked about technology forecasting in one form or another, and uh, uh, obviously in DSK we're thinking about defence applications. And uh, there have always been words on the slides about nanobio, and not quite sure what that means. But what you've done today has really given us some great insight to what it really might mean, obviously for the broader society, but defence as a, uh, a subset of that. We need to be aware of those developments and think of opportunities where we might explore them. Uh, so, look, that was a really fascinating presentation. I've really appreciated it. Hearing about the uh, the, the new golf balls, uh, the stronger materials, the, uh, the the drug treatment mechanisms, but obviously for aircraft people, um, aircraft fuel in the future is a really big challenge, um, and how we can uh, work with biofuels, how we can make them practical how we can make them um, sustainable in terms of the uh, aircraft performance, as well as obviously the manufacturing questions. These are very important to us. Uh, so it's really been an excellent thing for today to hear about your work there. Um, and I know it's something that we've uh, been doing a little bit of work to try to understand how it might uh, work with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, could I ask everyone to join me in, in thanking Ian and Claudia for their presentation today? And keeping with tradition, we give uh, a small black box to the people who give us our black box lectures. So I'd last like to present these now to Claudia and uh, Ian.
So thank you very much, everyone, for coming along today. I'm sorry we've run out of time. Um, the, there will be a short uh, tour and some technical discussions after this with um, Andrew uh, Goulet and with uh, Christy. Um, if anybody has specific topics or questions they'd like to explore, you might like to join on to that little uh, uh, tour group and um, um, have some one-on-one -on -one discussion time about anything that's important. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.